Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Tuesday topic. Today's topic is Rupture and the Repair, A Path to Healing. We have uh, some members of the CNHP um, a Board of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, uh, first, we have uh, Marcia Penn, who will talk about the rupture and the repair using the stop, drop, and address. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Denise Way will discuss rupture and repair, understanding different communication styles. Following that will be um, Roberta Perry, who um, will discuss the rupture and how to give effective feedback using racial candor. And then finally, our last presenter will be Michelle Radigan. We'll close the panel and discuss uh, rupture and how we can lean into self-compassion and mindfulness after causing harm to do better and not beat ourselves up. All right, so with that, let me throw it over to uh, Marcia Penn and get us started. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. So we are not in this space to problem solve or fix individual problems and conflicts. Next slide. So what we are here to do today is we are here to focus on our learning and our challenge zones. And some of you might be like, well, what does that mean? So for people who are educators in the room, you may be very familiar that when our students are in a state of panic or overwhelm, uh, our brains shut down and we literally cannot, uh, you know, have our students in a state where they can take in any kind of new information, right? Because they're in survival mode. So also when we're in a safe mode and a really, really comfortable mode, we're also not open to taking in some new information. So we kind of want to be in this learning edge of the challenge and the learning zone. Some of the things that we're going to be talking about today um, is not going to necessarily make us feel safe it might make us feel a little bit uncomfortable, but we certainly don't want any of us to feel really overwhelmed or panicked. So if at any point, any of the content that we're talking about today makes you start to feel a little overwhelmed or a little panicked, turn your camera off, get some water, stand up, stretch your muscles, take a walk, and then come back and rejoin us and resettle. So really listen to your bodies because we're gonna be taking a path with some courageous conversations today, but we do invite you to stay with all of us in that learning and that challenge zone. We acknowledge that Common humanity means shared suffering. Leaning into shared suffering and not turning away from pain and harm. The rupture is a path towards healing, the repair. Calling ourselves in when we've done harm and calling others out with care when they've done harm is a skill. We can all learn to do it and it requires practice. This also goes for accepting feedback without getting defensive or centering yourself when called out. Microaggressions occur when all levels of higher education, faculty meetings, classroom spaces, student recreational spaces, clinical sites, professional staff meetings, and executive meetings. Persons and stakeholders from all levels of the college would benefit from attending this Tuesday topic. So how are we gonna do this today? Well, each of us is gonna share a brief, personal yet de-identified story of rupture and then repair. Now, some of you might be wondering, what do we mean by rupture? Has anyone ever had an experience where it just felt like it was a communication breakdown? or something was said in a meeting and it just felt like that record scratch, that 
or it felt like glass shattering or fingernails going down a chalkboard, right? That rupture, that harm, that paper cut that just burns. And how do we move to repair? Well, after we share our own personal stories of rupture, we're going to then share an anecdote, a lesson, or a message that has helped each of us to do better moving forward after the rupture experience. Some of these include what we call stop, drop, and address, something that Roberta has read about in a book called Radical Candor, known as kind, clear, specific, and sincere in giving effective feedback, and something that I've read in a book called um, Oh, geez, I can't remember the name of the book, but it's in the references. My mind just went totally blank. It's been a long day. But the process is called Racial Justice from the Heart. And the heart is an acronym that we're going to be uh, looking at. Oh, I just remembered the name of the book. It's called Say the Wrong Thing by Dr. Amanda Kemp. Thank you, universe. Uh, so we're going to move forward. And I believe that Marcia Penn is going to talk to us first about the stop, drop, and address. Thank you. So let's talk, stop, drop, and address. So let me tell you my little story, which I'm calling rupture and no repair. I was in a meeting some time ago. There were six of us in the meeting. There was myself, two other African-American colleagues. And in the meeting with the outside company that we were with, there were three of them as well. There was a white male executive, a white female executive, and a black female um, director. And so as we were going through the meeting, there was a point in the meeting where there was, I'd say a miscommunication and it felt like some of us were not allowing the other person to finish speaking. And then the black female in the meeting said something that was, um, I call them pearl clutching moments. Um, there was a pearl clutching moments where she said something that we call sort of out of pocket um, and out of character and used a curse word. And just like I only stopped for that second, there was only a momentary stop. We did not drop an address. The meeting went on, the meeting continued, and the meeting ended. And after the meeting, my two colleagues and I got together and we talked about the uncomfortableness of what happened and this other Black female cursing. And, you, and it was just it was pearl clutching. That's the only way I can describe it. So we talked about it, but what the reason I say rupture and no repair is because it wasn't dealt with in the meeting. And so that really gave us time, the three of us, my colleagues, two colleagues and I, to sit back and reflect, how would we do different? Because you see that little thing I have, do me a favor, stop talking. That's certainly how we felt, but that's certainly not what happened. The communication happened after the fact with my colleagues and myself, and we talked about it. And I will say that since that time, I have tried to ensure that in meetings, I am doing the stop, drop, and address. And in part of our conversations that you hear later, as well as what I read a few moments ago, there are ways to stop, drop, and address where we are not disrespecting one another, but we are dealing with the situation and the miscommunication, things that were inappropriately said um, that we did not take a moment to talk about. And I can tell you from this point forward, being a member of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion um, Board here at CNHP, working in diversity outside, talking to my colleagues, it is now in a constant conversation for us. And I am comfortable that if this comes up ever again, that I am absolutely in a stop, drop, and address mode in a way that is respectful, but that people understand this is not something that you can do. Because while you don't want to disrespect the person, you also want to be able to leave a meeting and a situation feeling okay about self. And I know when we all left, we really were not feeling okay. So while we want to help the other person communication, we also want to feel whole and okay about the circumstances that um, we faced. So I'm gonna stop there because we have a lot more to talk about. Next slide, please. 
Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'm going to talk a little bit about communication styles, and I started off with passive aggressive um, behavior. At, I flipped it these because normally you would start off with a, a assertiveness, and I made that last. So these are some of the communication styles, and I'm sure this these are not new terms for um, uh, some of the, the people that's here today. One of the things that we talk about in contemporary health is the different communication styles. So as you can see, passive, aggressive. The person may appear passive, but really underneath the surface, they're really mad. They're angry, but, and we don't know the reason why. Uh, passive um, behavior, um, actually the person is, it appears to be almost timid and really can't get their thoughts and their expressions and ideas um, you know, they just uh, basically just sitting there and listen to whoever's leading the conversation. And aggressive, we talk about micro aggressive, but aggressive, aggressive behavior is somebody speaking loud. And when we think about aggressive um, behavior, almost think about almost like um, bullying a uh, person. But the one that most people are recognizing, which is used most often is, is assertiveness. And when you are assertive, you, you are voicing your opinion, you're able to express your needs and your ideas. But at the same time, you're not really, um, you're considering other people. You're not bullying anybody. And I think with assertiveness, and you can go to the next slide, <clears throat> some of the other key points I uh, point out on this next slide, this is a, a, a assertive communication. A process which positive and negative ideas and feelings are expressed in an open and direct way. And I think this is really pertinent. And in my situation, this happened in the classroom. And I was teaching and the student asked me a question. I can't remember whether it was about a grade or a test. And I explained to the student, I said, well, you know, a good time for us to, to discuss this is in my office, I told the student where my office was, and I said, we can, um, you can email me. But the student was persistent. And it was, you know, the classroom was full, and she was very persistent. It's just to say, well, I want, you know, why can't we talk about this now? And so I, I, I stepped back, and I, and I thought, and this is why I added to stop, drop, and address. And that's exactly what I did. I said, hold it, hold it. I just said, stop We you are. And I'd said, this behavior you're displaying, this is, is not accepted. I said, you know, I had explained to you, this is not the time to discuss this. My office is, you know, 980, and we can discuss this later. So I had to be very firm and clear. And I had to address it right then and there because I was in front of a class. And if the other students saw me, which I, had no intentions to do any confrontation, but I had to be professional. So again, that stop, drop, and address, you can use that in assertiveness. Some factors to consider, and I thought about, okay, is it culture, gender, or some things we sometimes don't think about? Is it personality type? Is it a level of confidence? So what helps me is Remember, therapeutic communication. We talk about this all the time, especially in nurses. Um, and when we think about therapeutic communication, we're talking about the patient and the client, but I actually bring this to everyday life because I try to understand maybe it's something going on. So some of the things that uh, when we think about therapeutic communication, which can help you, it can uh, help you overcome temporary stress, help you to get along with other people. And then, it can help you overcome some of those psychological blocks which stand in the way of self-realization. The one thing I didn't put on there is listen. Sometimes you have to listen and put yourself in the other person's shoes. And I, I think about the code of ethics and I think about me as a nursing professional. Had I had responded in a negative way to the student. This could happen vice versa. Uh, it could have been a, a teacher who's inappropriate with a student. But as a nursing profession, you have to think about the different things that we learn and the different things that we're teaching our students. So we have to be role models and show by example. 
So that's my story. So I'm gonna turn the next slide over to, um, I believe it's, uh, it's Roberta. Thank you for having us today. Um, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about giving uh, effective feedback. One of the things that we do in the marketing department was we decided how our office was going to, what, what kind of culture we wanted to have. And what we decided on, we, we read this book, Radical Candor, and we decided that that would be a really, really great um, kind of management style for us. And just a general, just a general way that we effectively work in our office. And what was really interesting about this is that this, you care personally, and then you challenge directly. So <clears throat> The, I didn't include this on my slide, but there are, there's a, an acronym, it's CORE, C-O-R-E, and I'll get to that in a second. But before we do this, um, I want to share my story. Um, I have a teenage son who is going to be graduating from high school, and we, he is a member of the LGBTQ community, and what, growing up where we grew, where he grew up, he was known as the mayor of First Avenue, right? Everybody knew him. Everybody looked out for him. He was a rambunctious kid, but he played with everybody and that was great. So, you know, when my son came out and we started having pride flags during all sorts of times of the year, uh, during pride month specifically, uh, a neighbor decided, and this isn't uncommon for this neighbor, decided to post something in the window in his car um, with his, whatever he wanted, you know, like this is where he kind of throws out the things that are generally on his mind that he, he wouldn't actually want to speak out loud. And so, um, so this is like a little bit of a trigger. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're sensitive to some of the words that they refer to, um, for people that are gay, just beware. So what he wrote, okay, so it was June, we put our flag out and um, he wrote and put it in his car, our brothers in arms and our veterans get one day and homos get a whole entire month, right? And so it was because I guess Veterans Day was not, whatever it was we were celebrating with that time. And as a mother, I now felt that my son was not safe in our neighborhood. And so, you know, as a mother, I also was angry. I mean, I was really angry. And thankfully my son can be a lot more mature than me sometimes. And he decided that, you know, his, his way to um, kind of take care of it was just to laugh it off. And I, I couldn't do that. So the rupture was the safety of our area, you know? Um, the repair part, I attempted to repair it and it was received poor, well, it wasn't received at all. And what I did was I thought about it in the sense of radical candor and giving effective feedback and knowing that it was probably gonna fall on deaf ears. I wrote him a letter and I said to him um, basically that, I was surprised by what he put in his window because he had been somebody that looked out for my son while he was growing up. And that was really, it was shocking to me to see that. And um, I said, you know, just like, well, that's what I said. And then I said, you know, I understand that, you know, veterans and people that are in the military and give service is important to you. So I would love to talk to you a little bit about what's important to you in that arena and so that we can get back to being a very happy little neighborhood. Um, and I had found out that the letter went right into the trash. So that's fine, that's him. He's since done a few other things that haven't been very nice, but it's he's angry and I don't think that any kind of um, attempt on my part for giving feedback will ever work. Um, so what's really interesting about the feedback is it can be positive feedback as well as negative feedback. And the whole thing kind of is runs, a, a, it's the same concept. So the one thing when we're doing feedback in the office, 
the first thing we do is we ask the person, you know, I'd like to give you some feedback. Are you in a space where you would be open to listen? And if the answer is no, then you move on and then you come back to it at a different time. Um, I think that it's really a good idea to be humble when you are approaching this because I, I could have read the situation completely wrong. I could have been completely wrong about this. And to be helpful, you know, we want to, what we want to do is we want to give you feedback to either have you do less of what you're doing with criticism or more of what you did when we're giving praise. Um, some of the other tips are to uh, do it immediately, like uh, Marcia was saying. Um, we want to praise in public and criticize in private. And it can't be about the personality. You know, it can't be, it, it needs to be about something. The feedback has to be about something that the person can actually change um, or work on if they so choose. So the core, the core um, thing is context. So what you wanna do is you wanna be specific. If it's not gonna be immediate, then you have to bring back the context of it. So this it was the specific situation. Like this is what, what happened. Your observance, so what you observed that was said or done, and then what it what was the result of that? So there was an example of um, Kim Scott who wrote this book, and she had talked about uh, um, she was giving a presentation and she used um like every third word was um, and so her boss had been in the room, and she said to her after, I'd like to give you some feedback. And she said, oh, sure. She said, you know, basically I observed you saying um, a lot. And the result of that is you look stupid. Now, I don't know if she said you look stupid in those words, but it makes you look unintelligent or whatever. And so, you know, that was, that was basically the feedback. And to Kim, it was very shocking. But I think that it really did kind of lead her into this pathway of like, how do you want to get the best out of a person? Like, what do you want to tell them? And in some cases, the feedback that you have to give is very uncomfortable. You know, you, it's uncomfortable for you as a person to give that feedback because you could have been the person that was harmed. Um, and it could be very uncomfortable for the person that's receiving the feedback. But you want to, again, care personally. You really do care about this person. You're not going to call them names. You're not going to attack them. But you're going to challenge them directly by saying, here's what happened and what can we do about it? So that's basically, it's a, it's a fantastic book. And also as a side note, um, Kim and another person wrote a recent book and it's about, um, it's about bias, implicit bias. And there's some really great videos out there. If you just Google Kim Scott and um, implicit bias, you'll see the, the movement that she's making in that, um, in that arena. So that's my story. Thanks, Roberta. I'm gonna move on. And so uh, we've heard some stories today about people uh, witnessing and experiencing harm uh, done to them directly or to people that they love. Um, I'm gonna share with you a story of rupture where I caused harm and received no feedback and what I did with that using racial justice from the heart in leading into self-compassion. So as some of you know, who know me well and know my scholarship, my scholarship is in self-compassion and I'm often tapped to do a lot of self-compassion workshops. And at the beginning of the pandemic and at the height of a lot of um, police brutality that's been going on for a really long time, but it's, it's when the uh, news networks were um, kind of waking up to the reality of what was happening and uh, showing a lot of it on TV. I was tasked with um, doing a presentation of, of self-compassion in difficult times and was asked to also speak about uh, what was happening um, to persons um, 
who were being harmed, who, you know, are persons in the Black and African American community. And I really felt like I could speak of it, but it really wasn't a strong area of scholarship. And so I had reached out to a colleague and um, asked if they would be interested in presenting with me. And immediately after sending that email, felt sick to my stomach and realized uh, how much harm I had caused in thinking that I was doing something in um, not overreaching and trying to do something outside of uh, my own knowledge and scholarship, but reaching out to someone who did have that scholarship and then recognizing how, how harmful that was in terms of their own lived experiences and personhood and how they themselves identified um, as a woman of color and how much that I was emotionally taxing them at that moment. And after having that realization and calling a colleague who I typically turn to for supervision and for mentorship to process it, um, sent another email saying, I recognize that I may have caused some harm and I'm sorry. And I never heard back from that person. And I didn't deserve to hear back from that person. I needed to use my own spaces, my own white affinity group, my own mentorship and supervision um, to work that out and to work that through, to recognize that when you're the person that causes harm, you don't center yourself in that relationship and you don't expect for there to be a conversation for that person to come back and put a Band-Aid on your boo-boo when you realize that you cause harm because it causes you harm back because it doesn't ever feel good when you realize that you've hurt someone that you care about deeply. And I'm just gonna let that sit for just a minute. That other person doesn't owe you anything when you've caused harm. What we do need to do is learn from that and fail forward. What we do need to do is lean into self-compassion and pull from what we already have inside to recognize how this can be our own learning edge, our own challenge and learning zone, if you will, to do better next time and to recognize that um, we need to be more self-reflexive. We need to be more mindful. And Dr. Amanda Kemp wrote the book, Say the Wrong Thing. And she talks about this an acronym, racial justice from the heart, the H representing holding space for transformation. And she says that people from all different backgrounds, races, identities, and cultures, we all step in it. We all make mistakes. We all say the wrong thing. And it's important for us to practice present moment awareness without judgment, because that allows us to hold potential space for transformation to occur. The E stands for expressing yourself, giving yourself space to journal, make art, walk in nature, dig in the dirt. Just don't burden that person that you've harmed with your white fragility if you identify as a white person or your white tears if you identify as a white person or your white guilt like I had if you identify as a white person. The A stands for act with intention and lean into self-compassion. And when we do that, there's a part of self-compassion that's called common humanity. And it really is a way of oneness in our racialized community when we're able to find common ground and recognize that 
human suffering is common. It is a way forward towards healing, repair, and understanding. As human beings, we all suffer. The R stands for reflecting on yourself. I did that in my affinity space with my supervisor and in mentorship. Self-reflexivity is the first step towards cultural humility. And the last one is trusting the process. It's never perfect. It's always messy. And in fact, we always risk saying the wrong thing. But you know what? Conversation creates connection and movement. And when we're silent, silent can be interpreted as avoidance and maintaining the status quo. And I share with you in the slide, the center picture is a broken piece of pottery that's put together with gold. And some of you may or may not be familiar. It's actually um, a Japanese art form called kintsugi. And it's the process of taking broken pottery, putting it back together and lining the cracks with gold. And the metaphor is to embrace our flaws and our imperfections. So when we have these ruptures and we're moving towards repair, whether you're using practicing your assertiveness or remembering to engage and stop, drop and address or be kind and clear and specific or leaning into self-compassion and using racial justice from the heart, it's important to remember that none of this is striving for perfection because there's no such thing as perfection. We all come with these beautiful imperfections and flaws. So well, that was, uh, I love that bowl, Michelle, very touching. So now we'd like to hear from you. Can you imagine using one of these interventions to repair or prevent a rupture? Is there one you have used that we did not talk about today? So thank you all for your time today. The CNHP DNR board will be accepting applications soon for new members. So please check your Drexel email for updates. So, so now this is your opportunity um, to tell us your stories, tell us what your thoughts. And please just unmute and just start talking. Any thoughts, any questions? I, I would like to say something. I'm trying to get my picture off. My name's Thea. Oh, hi. Hi, hi, everybody. Um, I'm a recent graduate. I, actually, I graduated last month from the BSN program. Yay. And I'm about to start my MP um, at Penn in mental health. So I'm really, really excited. And it's one of the reasons I'm here. Um, and when I signed up, I wasn't really sure 100% of what the topic would be or how it would be expressed. But you know, I've, I've been sitting here very emotional and, um, you know, I, I recently had a situation. Um, first, I'll just give you a little background. I work in the emergency department um, and I'm a, I got my um, RN about two years ago and I've been in the ED for two years. And at one um, facility where I worked, uh, we, we had, it was a trauma. The patient um, had been in an accident and unfortunately they had been drinking as well. So there was intoxication involved and um, they didn't speak any English. I don't know if they were Mexican or what, I don't, I don't really know the, you know, their cultural background. But, um, and the day when this happened, I was in a situation where I was precepting a student um, from Gwinnett Mercy College. So he was there and helping. And we went over to the CT and it was myself, my student, another nurse who was doing the trauma and um, the physician, the trauma physician and the CT tech. And all of a sudden the trauma physician starts saying that, oh, they're probably illegal and that's why they were running. And I mean, he just starts saying all of these really racist things about they don't go to the doctor because they, I mean, just totally inappropriate. And I was 
stunned. I mean, I, I kind of looked around to just try to see what everyone now, and, and just to give you some background, I'm the only Brown full-time nurse there. there. There was one there previous to me and she left and went, you know, per diem. I actually, you know, kind of left the organization as well and I've, I've moved on, but it was very uncomfortable and I didn't know the doctor very well. So I think it's one thing when you have a relationship with someone and something happens um, and you care about them. There's another thing when you kind of know the person, but you don't really care. And you kind of feel like, well, you know, I'm just going to avoid them. I mean, that that's my, my standard way of dealing. Something happens and I'm like, well, avoidance, you know, because it's easier. But in this situation, I was so taken aback and really pissed off about it, like angry. And I didn't know him, this physician at all, had never worked with him before. And it was, I'll just preface it too and say it was 2.30 in the morning. I'm a night shift nurse. And I was leaving at 3 a.m. So all of these things, and I was taken aback and I left and I was mad about it. And then I was back a few days later and I pulled the charge nurse to the side that I trust because I felt like, yeah, I know we should deal with things in the moment, but sometimes it might be better to like step back process but still do something. Cause I felt like if I don't do anything, this is just going to weigh on me. Right. So I talked to the charge nurse. She recommended, I talked to our manager and then she recommended that I file an incident report, um, mm -hmm. you know, for professional behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did all of that that day. I mean, I, I stayed until probably like eight, eight 30 that next morning, making sure I filed. And what I also did was I made sure, cause the next time I had my precepting student in, he was there with me um, that day. And then the very next day I was there. And I made sure I had a conversation with him about Good. that. Good. And I made sure that I talked to him about, you know, how inappropriate it was and how we can't stand by and let this happen. Mm -hmm. And how that even if he as a student sees things, he, we have to speak up because it's not going to change if we don't. Mm -hmm. And I also called the other nurse. Now, mind you, I was the only brown person in the room at the time. No one agreed with the doctor. No one, you know, shook their head and wait. Like just, it was just silence while he talked and said his racist comments. But I called the other nurse who was there, who's a travel nurse, okay? And he was actually the head of, you know, he was, um, I don't know, the scribe and kind of in charge of the trauma. And I called him on the phone. I knew he had been working that night at Hershey. So he was up, it was like 7.30 in the morning. And I called him to try to see if he could remember specific things that were said, because I mean, I, I think I just went somewhere else when these comments started happening. And I, I was like, you know, wishing I could have like maybe written them all down right after it happened. But in either event, I called and I said something to him and he vaguely remembered it. But then he said, you know, you're right. What he said was inappropriate. And I, I wasn't even thinking about it like that. Mm -hmm. And this is a guy who him and his wife have adopted three brown girls, I think from DR from I mean, and they're Spanish speaking there. And he thanked me then for calling him and bringing it to his to his attention and talking to him about it. Because he said, you know, my girls would not, you know, they're going to be affected and I have to think about them and what their perspective is. So um, hopefully I didn't take up too much time, but I just wanted to, to bring this to light because, you know, as you were talking, I'm like, oh my gosh, this just happened. And I'm still like, you know, I, after this happened, I, another nurse, I was leaving. It was like my last day to there, my last week working there. And another nurse called me to wish me well. And she is actually from Puerto Rico. And I said to her, like, I have to tell you what happened. This is really upsetting to me. And she got really upset. Now, I know if she had been there, she probably would have addressed it right then. Mm -hmm. She is a charge nurse there. She's been there a long time. She has relationships. But not only did she support me, um, but she also talked to the physicians there and the ED physicians and talked to them about it so that they're aware of what's going on. So I definitely felt supported. But, mm -hmm. you know, I just want to say that, like, it, it, it still kind of wears on me because even some of the, the doctors who are white were saying, well, why didn't she say anything right then? Well, look at the space I'm in. Look yeah. at who is in power here. Yeah. You no, know? and it's I, tough. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll hold it there, but thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thank you so much. I want to acknowledge a couple of things that you said, and thank you so much for the story. And I'm sorry that that happened to you. One was 
you know, we also have to think about power and privilege in, in, the, in terms of like rank. Like when you're a student, you're an intern, you're a practicum and thinking about like, it should never be this way, but like doctor nurse. I literally had one time a doctor pat me on the head and call me a little girl. And I was a colleague of his and I had a question. I was a master's level therapist. I was not a little girl yet still patted me on the head. Um, so I think that when we, we have those moments, they catch us off guard. And so what you did do was something that was within your power was to file the incident report. And then you did have a lot of support from the people around you. So you did still make an impact. So instead of focusing on what I should have done, because hindsight is always 2020, instead focus on what you did do was make an impact with that incident report, which might have more of an impact on this person than you calling him out because he might've minimized anything that you would have said in that moment anyway. So kudos to you for doing that. That's amazing. So thank you so much for sharing that story. Well, well thank you. And I just want to say too, that like my significant other was afraid for me to say something. Mm -hmm. He didn't want me to say anything. He felt like it was going to cause blowback and I was going to be blacklisted and I was going to have all these tr troubles later. And I just felt like, well, you know what, if that's what happens, I don't need to be there anyway, because if anybody has taken issue with me bringing this up, then psh, see ya. Right. So, you know, right. but I understand what he means because he's like, well, you know, you don't want you to, you'd be like blacklisted somewhere else or what have you. So, you know, and I get that, but in my heart, I needed to do something where I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do right. live with myself. Right. Thank you. Dr. DePew, I see your, I see your hand raised. I do. This is, um, I just want to share an experience I had many years ago and it, it wasn't about really race, but it, it, it's really about rupture. We had uh, the chief of cardiothoracic surgery called everybody babe. So whatever, whoever the nurse, so babe, what's the cardiac index, babe, how are they doing? And one of my colleagues from Lebanon said to him, my name is May, it is not Babe. And from that day forward, he never, ever called her Babe, always called her May. So it's just an example of when you stop and you address it and you tell that people, change can actually happen. So I just wanted to air, add that. But it was, it was until she stopped the behavior that change actually occurred. I, I, I wanted to say something really quick, uh, Diane, that, you know, I think sometimes people are so ingrained in their ways that they don't even realize what they're doing. Right. And I think it's like, you have to say something to them, like, like she did, that calls attention to that and says, oh, this is something that you shouldn't be doing. And because it's something, you know, I think about all the times that I, I've used a phrase or something and I've just used it my whole entire life. And then one time I looked it up, but I was like, well, I can't use that anymore. But it wasn't until, you know, somebody has to call you out on it and thankfully it went the right way. But yeah, right, yeah, because sometimes we don't know that we're, in, that we're offending someone. Right, right. Way too quiet. Way too. I also want to, I'll say this and thank Thea. I also want to say that, you know, sometimes it's a lot of work. It's a heavy lift. It can be a very heavy lift. And, um, you know, sometimes you don't, you go down the path, you don't even know it's going to be heavy lift. Other times you kind of say, okay, here we go. Or you talk to somebody and say, you know what, I really need to do this. And this is going to be a heavy lift. Um, and I just think sometimes we have to acknowledge that it's, it's, it's going to be a heavy lift. And that's not comfortable either. Mm -hmm. um, but I think having conversations like this and um, continue to talk with colleagues. I will say again, for me, one of the reasons I think we also didn't call our colleague out at the time because we recognized here were three, you know, um, professional black females. We didn't want to call out the only other lone black female on the other team. So we didn't want to do that also. Um, yeah. You know, we talked about that later and realized we all had sort of that same thought, you know, like we're not going to call the sister out. 
you know, because then how's that going to look to the other two white executives were there? You know, here's his three sisters calling out. So we that was also a conversation we had, but we had to go back. But we, at least for ourselves, went back and debriefed and processed what happened to understand it, talk about how we felt, and if it happened again, how we would move forward. And we, you know, we've met with that group um, times after that, and nothing, you know, ha else happened again. Um, and maybe there was some acknowledgement on that end. That's something mm -hmm. that that we'll never know. Sometimes things correct themselves. Um, and we're just kind of, you know, grateful for that the universe takes care of some things that we don't always know how they've been taken care of. We have to acknowledge that as well. And, and see, I was on mute and I, sorry, I just wanted to uh, tell you because you are a new nurse. Um, and I've been a nurse for many years. And just going back to the story you told, I've had uh, many experiences and starting out new and, and some of the communication styles, passive. You know, you, you passive, you kind, you don't want to say the wrong things. And I'll just say this, over the years, um, and this is where the assertive, assertiveness came, comes in, um, and experience working with different cultures, which they may not know, and I'll just share this short story. I had a physician that come, used to come in and he would say, uh, whose patient is this? Where's the chart? Where is that? And I just stopped. Everybody was scrambling and trying to find the, the chart. It was my patient. I wasn't scrambling. I didn't say anything. I just watched the physician just howl all over the place. And then he said, whose patient is it? It's my patient. He didn't even say good morning. So he was still ranting and raving, but I went to answer him. He was like, uh, this and that. And I said, excuse me. My name, my name is uh, Denise Way. Good morning to you too. Good morning. And he stopped for a second and he looked. He said, good morning. So over the time from then on, from that experience, he would come at, good morning, Denise. Good morning. And I said, oh, good morning, <laughs> so-and-so. But I would say that it didn't happen right away because we learn and we're trying to understand. And my husband used to tell me the same thing. Oh, you're going to get in trouble for such and such. But as I've learned to be more assertive, and again, trying not to be disrespectful, but just stopping them right in their tracks and say, listen, this is, this is not what happened. It's not happening. And you'll learn to be more assertive as you continue on nursing and just to stop them right then and there. And what you did, I commend you. Excellent, because you follow through, because so often we don't follow through with doing things. So hang in there, it gets better. Um, I can share a little bit, because this is, um... I feel like I've had so, so many rupture and repair conversations. And I love this topic of like, I, I just, I appreciate the way you set it up today, kind of sharing stories and also sharing just like different ways to approach rupture and repair. Um, and because so I've had some that were very successful, some that were not successful. Um, and it's something I'm just like always thinking about just kind of communication and how do we, show up authentically, but then also like leave grace for mistakes. Um, but I think something that just kind of, that I've been struggling with a lot or just thinking about a lot lately is that feeling of wanting to like express care, or, like as, so as an instructor, right? There's this, we're holding space for a group of students and I technically, I, I care for all of them and want them to learn and grow. And so instances where there's like a student has done harm, you know, some sort of microaggression happens and there's harm, especially around racial, like around white supremacy, white privilege, like a white student says some sort of racial microaggression. And I think like holding this tension of like, I, I feel I feel like the frustration come up and sort of a lack of care almost just wanting to be like here's what happened here's why it was wrong just sort of to preserve like the safety and the compassion for the students of color in the room and so I think that's something I'm like and I don't know if it's like me sort of um 
it's an expression of like certain parts of my white fragility that I don't have tolerance for. And it comes out at these at white students, you know, but I think, yeah, it's just something I've, I've like thought about a lot, even, you know, with race, but also with like any other dimension of identity where it's sort of like, we're in a group where there's a lot of different identities. How do we sort of like address this thing, express care for this person, but also not centering their sort of like, mm -hmm what's happening there does that make sense it does yeah i i want to touch on that erica thank you for bringing that in and and patrice had put a question in the um chat box that connects with that um in terms of how do you address it as a student towards faculty and professional staff too with like the stop and address method one of the things um from an instructor perspective i find really helpful is setting guidelines at the beginning of the course to address this. How do we want to function and collaborate as a community of learners? What are some of the guidelines in our course? And how are we going to address missteps and microaggressions because they're going to happen? Because that's human nature is for us to say the wrong thing and to make mistakes. How are we as a community of learners uh, going to call in and call out and what is our method to do that to keep this to be uh, to keep us in the challenge and the learning zone the um, the safe challenge and an overwhelm zone that I shared with you in the slides today we go over that in the beginning of every course of every quarter and we talk about what that means for us as a class and it's a two-way street. So it's not just the guidelines that the students are following, but it's the guidelines that I, as the instructor, am also following. So then we can start to build uh, a relationship and language together. I know that there are some people in the past, there have been some classes where they've actually used words to, uh, to describe uh, uncomfortable situations. There was one group for instance, they love to use the word ouch. And they would say ouch, like when a microaggression would happen and we would address it. Um, and there are some situations where it's, you know, it'll be messy and it's not perfect. And it's like, how do you hold the space where you want to keep it safe and you want to make sure that you are acknowledging that a microaggression occurred and it was inappropriate? And then maybe things don't get addressed in a class, they get addressed in a class, and then you follow up with individual students outside of class to make sure that they understand why you needed to call certain things out. Um, so that would be my answer to that. It may not be for every single situation, but I find that having guidelines for all classes um, that I create with the students have been really, really helpful. And I don't know if there's any other um, instructors in here who've done something similar or, have any other suggestions, but um, that just really kind of was was very helpful that I've done in the past and, and do currently. Um, just to add to something Michelle was saying about language, um, I think one of the things that we're doing in my department is we have to discuss language around what what is what's acceptable. And how are we going to identify something when it, it could be a microaggression or it's something that is definitely not, um, you know, it, it's, diff, it, it's a potential to cause harm. So I think if, if, you know, like Michelle was saying, if you can have those guidelines and you can discuss common language and even a way, um, Diane at one point, sent us that video and what they did in the video was they used like a purple flag so that if like they're in the middle of a meeting and somebody says something they actually wave a purple flag and that you know that's one way to do that but the only reason they do that is because they have this common language and they've all agreed upon having this type of um you know interaction or way to call somebody out so i do think that that is a good way to think of it as well I'm going to jump in really fast because I do not want to be the last voice you hear today. So I'm sure that the panel wants to summarize. So hello to everyone that I know. For those of you I don't know, then I'm just really sad about that. If we're meeting for the first time, I'm Dr. Veronica Carey. I'm the chair of the Board of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I'm also your assistant dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So welcome to everyone who's here. 
And um, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Um, who would have known, uh, Marcy, that when I sat there in our board meeting, as you referenced when you were presenting, that I see the members of the Board of Diversity, Equity, and, and Inclusion as leaders in this realm, whether they're currently leaders, they desire to refine their leadership strategy. And one day we talked about something that I didn't realize was going to turn into what um, Michelle called a model today as stop, drop, and address. But it's so critical that we follow that. It's so critical. I thought about it in terms of stop, drop, and roll, right? But we have to stop, drop, and address, whether it be in the moment, next day, you know, I always say in vivo to the students, right? In, in the moment. Um, but it's, it is critical. And um, the second part of that stop, drop, and address is have your first five words. You know, if it's something, you know, start practicing, Michelle knows this, you know, start practicing your first five words. You know, have something to break the ice. You know, Erica, maybe something like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm sitting a little uncomfortable. And I always joke with students, I don't care if it's four or six words, don't quote, don't count them. But have your first five words. You know, I'm a little uncomfortable about what just happened. Just something that you are going to be able to pull up immediately to then start the conversation. Then you can think about what I want to say next. Mm -hmm. so the person goes, oh, what are you talking about? Well, I'm referring to what you just said. Mm -hmm. You see, and that way you don't have to be the problem solver. You're just the, the conversation starter or you are the recognizer, right? Mm -hmm. So um, for like, I think, of, I think Denise had mentioned it when she was presenting that, you know, we're our membership drive. Think about this. Look at the four leaders that you have on this panel and how on our board meetings, and there's several more board members present and past that are here, um, we do a lot of good work. You know, we work to make CNHP inclusive, more inclusive, share with equity, more di diverse, retention of students, retentions of faculty, you know, making faculty more diverse. These conversations are imperative, right? So we need to figure out a way to get, I always say each one, reach one. When you register for one of these, make sure you have someone else register for one of these. Mm -hmm. So they can sit down and sit with you and you, you can have a collegial conversation. Oh, you missed a great opportunity. We had a panel of, of um, individuals who were talking about rupture and repair. They had four different illustrations. It was phenomenal. Oh, good thing it's recorded. Let's watch it together. You'll hear my question in, in, in comment, right? So I just think that this is really important um, work that needs to be done. But I think those, not only the stop, drop, and address, but those first five words, just something to then get the repair started. And you'd be, you'd be amazed about Eric, about how far that can take you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it okay if I respond to that super quick? Cause I, I love that you said that. Cause that was actually what happened in the moment where I was just like, I feel confused, you know, <laughs> it's just so like, I like, I like that. Yeah, just perfect. I like that sort you of, you don't uh, have to repair the rupture. You can start mm -hmm. the conversation. I also want to just acknowledge a beautiful um, connection in the chat between two of our amazing students, uh, Lana and Patrice, um, just talking about how, you know, we also need to do better as faculty. You know, having space to talk about this is also about the willingness of the faculty member to create space for these conversations to happen. And, you know, let's be real. Um, Drexel is a predominantly white institution and not all faculty members feel comfortable having these courageous conversations or having first five words or even knowing that as a skill or a tool um, and being able to um, come to these kinds of conversations willingly and openly uh, with students and recognizing how important and essential they are to create uh, collaborative learning spaces that are inclusive and welcoming for all, which is true equity, right? It's not an equitable space if you don't feel welcomed. And if you don't feel welcomed, how are you going to be sustained and retained in your education and professionally, right? This is something that we learned from Dr. Carey in our DEI board meetings, and we talk about a lot. So we do have a wonderful student and professional staff panel coming up. I believe it's on the 24th of May um, that is talking about this topic. And I believe Lana, you're gonna be on that panel as well. 
And I think we need to talk more about this because we're out of time and we're not going to have space to give that the energy and the time um, and the bandwidth that it absolutely deserves. And I would say, um, Patrice, join our board <laughs> and um, let's make this a project that you can work on because um, this is essential for retention and it's essential for sustainability for, um, for professionals and for students at Drexel, 100%. I hear you and I feel you, which is why I'm trying to do better as a faculty member as well. Um, do any of our uh, board members, my fellow panelists want to uh, have any final statements before we sign off for today? Um, again, join us. Um, we've learned some valuable lessons, as Dr. Kerry have said, uh, Michelle. Um, it's an opportunity um, to express yourself, but also not just express yourself, just to share, come up with ideas. And, and one thing I really like um, with Dr. Kerry, she has you thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. You know, we sit in this little box and we sit in here and we're just silent. So she really gets you to be cre creative and really think out of the box. Um, Thea and everybody that's out there, and please think about joining. I've had a wonderful experience um, being on the diversity, equity, and inclusion board. And um, it's just given me opportunities to really voice um, how you know I've been feeling for years. We didn't have this platform. So I remember years ago, and I would kind of share this story. When I first uh, started at Drexel, I used to go down to 34th Street and they had the diversity and equity inclusion. But thank goodness for Dr. Carey, she went down there and look, five years. So um, again, <laughs> I'm really appreciative of having this board here at CNHP because I used to go to 34th Street. So I'm really appreciative of Dr. Carey's uh, mission, her vision for the board and, and all the people that I have met and shared stories from different diverse backgrounds. Um, so I really thank you. And it would be a great opportunity for anybody out there who wants to join. Mm -hmm. you know, well said, Denise, I agree. And I appreciate having worked with um, this group of panelists. Um, we knew each other, but I will say we've gotten to know each other even better mm -hmm. um, and know that we can collectively call on each other as well. Right back at you, Michelle. We've had some, some good laughter on a you know serious matter, but we were able to um, get it done. And um, thank you. I'll have to say this is sort of my swan song. We'll be leaving the board as well, but appreciate Dr. Carey and that stop, drop and address. When she first said that, I'm going, that is it. That is absolutely it. And so um, just want to thank and all of you for coming and just, you know, being here and being willing to listen, participate and do the work just, and just do the work. So thank you. I just want I'm sorry, I think I might be the last word. Potential harm that was last month with Flossie. If you see Flossie still here with her last name, Irati, she did a wonderful presentation. It's taped. I would watch that one first and then engage your colleagues to watch this one. It'll be a nice segue to have those conversations where you have staff meetings and faculty meetings, et cetera. You don't know what to talk about. These two sessions would be ideal. Michelle. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, typing to Patrice. I was saying, yes, Patrice. I was loving everything that was being typed in the, um, in the uh, spot yeah, there. Yeah. Roberta, anything you wanna say before we sign off? No, just uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity I've learned um, so much about myself and so much stuff that I never learned as a kid going to school. And I'm just very, very appreciative for the opportunities that the board has afforded me, but also um, just starting conversations. It gave me, it gave me a sense of, um, I don't want to say power, but it, it gave me a sense that I could actually start these conversations. And those are the ones that I've been having with lots of people. It's very uh, rowdy at my dinner table and we get into a lot of really great conversations and um, you know, it, it's just wonderful. So I, I appreciate this board and I also am going off the board. So, but I, I so I, I hope people, you know, will join. I too am going off of the board this summer, uh, but it is the beginning of my DEI journey because uh, I'm not ending anything that I've started. So um, 
please consider joining us. This has been a life-changing opportunity. Um, I thank all of you for your time and attention and the bandwidth at the end of the day. And uh, please continue to have some of those uh, courageous conversations. And we thank you so much. Be well, everybody.